Welcome back to another episode of West Respected, where we bring you Game of Thrones, the old seasons, and the new. I'm Jeff. I'm Ron, and I had the weirdest fucking evening, Jeff. I... Go on. I performed CPR on a baby doll, um, including breathing over its nose and mouth. I got to flip them all around upside down and banging on their back and stuff in case they were choking. I got to do all kinds of weird maneuvers with baby dolls. Well, that just sounds disturbing. And got to watch a video that was probably made circa 1990 um, with some of the most piss poor acting you ever saw in any high school video that you ever had to watch in any class. Um about all these techniques and um i have come to the conclusion that uh yeah babies are rough <laughs> i could have told you that dude <laughs> how long do you have to be in those classes for that just sounds terrible um the first one was tonight it was like six thirty to 9 or nine thirty, something like that and I don't know. We've got like four more to go or something. Oh, fuck that. <laughs> but Jeff, if you do them all, you get a discount on the last one. But, you know, that was your evening. <laughs> I've just been sitting around watching, you know, fucking Luke Cage and Defenders teasers because it's Comic Con. See, my priorities are straight. <laughs> you were worried about your quote unquote family <laughs> my, I'm worried about quote unquote San Diego my priorities were do not piss off the pregnant lady that has twins uh, that's a good call that's yeah. a good call alright uh, let's go ahead and jump on in uh, this episode uh, is going to be for Game of Thrones season 1 episode 4 if this is your first time joining us basically what this show is is it is a sister show to our main show on the channel tonight's watch Tonight's Watch is where we talk about the brand new episodes of Game of Thrones. We just uh, wrapped up our first season with season six. And now we went back in the meantime since the show's on break and are going back to the very beginning. So this is episode four, Cripples, Bastards, and Broken Things. And what we do with this show is we are basically going back to the beginning and looking at the show with the perspective of having seen all of the seasons and know all of the things. So we will be spoiling everything that has happened from seasons one through six of Game of Thrones. So please, please come back and rejoin us after you are caught up if you are not. Um, so yeah, let's jump on in. Uh, this episode specifically is tailor-made for revisiting. Yes, it is. They throw so much backstory at you <laughs> that I'm pretty sure my brain melted probably the first time I watched it. <laughs> first time I watched it, it all went over my head. It was the second time I ever watched this episode that, um, yeah, all, just so much backstory and still a lot of it inferred, too. Uh, yeah, this. Uh, first of all, I would like to say this is actually one of my favorite episode titles. I've always liked oh, this yeah. title. Yeah, fantastic. this title's fantastic. And so is the line too. that it stems from. Do what? So is the line that it stems from. Yes. Uh, yeah, we, and we will have that quote in there once we actually get to the scene, too. Um, and the, tit the title really works, too, because this episode almost works like a mashup of Game of Thrones campfire stories when you think about it. Yeah, more or less. Like, they're, like this could easily have been like... Like, you know how uh, big book series will sometimes put, like, an appendix appendix that has, like, you know, random side stories? Yeah. This episode almost could work as, like, a, a an appendix to all of fucking Game of Thrones. Like, so much. You know what else I noticed, too? Is this the first time that their episode title picked a theme and the whole episode was followed that theme like they did all throughout season six? Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of... Uh, well, the, the first one uh, kind of works. It's like Winter is Coming. Yeah. Kind of works. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying. Uh, what was the name of episode two? Because the uh, last one was Lord Snow. That's not that, really. Much that, was that, that, is that the King's Road? Yeah, that's the. Yeah. So this would be the first one that has, like you said, similar to season six, like an actual recurring theme. Yeah. Yeah, uh, let's let's go ahead and get uh, get the show started. Unless you had, did you have any other quick overall thoughts before we jump in? Nope. Uh, let's see. The very first thing we see is some three-eyed raven foreshadowing. I thought it was really cool 
how the first time you were introduced to the Three-Eyed Raven is in Winterfell, and that ended up being such a focal point. It, it, if you noticed in the uh, other three episodes, you saw the raven around Bran every once in a while, but it was never the Three-Eyed Raven. This is the first yeah. time you saw the Three-Eyed Raven, and it's his first vision. Yeah, it's his first vision, the first time you actually see the raven itself. Uh, he's walking around Winterfell exactly like he does in the new season. Like I thought that was a really, really cool payoff. Like, this episode will go and show you. <laughs> this, this scene, after season six, just blows your goddamn mind. It, like, it's crazy. This episode shows you just how much w- was planned in advance between Martin and Benioff and Weiss. It's crazy. Because I think at this point... The the actual it was, it was yeah I'm pretty sure by the time they were probably planning and writing this episode I don't think a Dance with Dragons the fifth book had come out yet so a lot of the stuff they're foreshadowing in this one like that brand stuff probably wasn't actually out for viewers and readers yet it was probably told to Benioff and Weiss by Martin himself like what he was doing so yeah there's some deep fucking cuts in this episode yeah really there good is. Too. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, Bran wakes up from the vision. It's actually the first time I think you hear Hodor speak. It's the first time you're actually introduced to Hodor. Yes. And every goddamn time Hodor says Hodor, my heart just breaks. Oh, a little bit I know. Further. Um, I believe it's the first time that you've really even paid any attention to Hodor. I think he's kind of seen in the background of yeah. other episodes. You only pay attention to him because you know who he is. Um, but yeah, like on your first viewing, he would just be a figure in the background. So the first time you're introduced to him, he's already tied to Bran. Yeah, and he's already literally carrying him. Yes. Fuck you, Bran. <laughs> Fuck you, Bran. Um, so I'll start so, calling him Bland. Just because <laughs> I know what he becomes. Yeah, no kidding. Uh Hodor brings in um, Bran to basically talk with uh, Tyrion and Rob. This is the the line uh, that le- that it leads up to from the title. Uh, the first quote I wrote down though was um, Tyrion basically calls him a cripple. You know, Bran is very very like defensive about. It. He says, "I'm not a cripple." It's like fucking amazing Dinklage delivery. It's like <laughs> then I'm not a dwarf. My father will rejoice to hear it. <laughs> I loved that scene, dude. I laughed out loud. Yeah, and then he continues on. Basically, he gives uh, Rob and their uh, their blacksmiths the blueprints to be able to actually make a saddle for him. Where he'd be able to ride like very cool. And then Rob, very how to train your dragon, and very cool. <laughs> Rob, in true season one Stark fashion, immediately calls out Tyrion for ulterior motives. And then they have the line where he says, I have a tender spot in my heart for cripples, bastards, and broken things. One of the best lines from the show, probably. Yes. Out there at the whetstone line. Yeah, it is so, like... A lot of good, memorable lines from season one that I did not... Memorable. (laughs) You know? (laughs) I did not memorable. (laughs) I didn't didn't remember the memorable lines until going back. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Yeah, that that whole scene's fantastic. I actually like the the acting by... uh, I think Richard Madden is the actor who's Rob. His the look in his eyes when he is you know that's that genuine distrust and anger. Yeah, he was very good in that scene. He, he was he was great. Uh, did you have anything else to add with that scene? No, I just I uh, just love the final line. I think I think it's the final line that Tyrion has. Um, and it says that there's a whorehouse just beyond your wall or a brothel just beyond your walls. I'll find a bed there and we'll both sleep better tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I liked that. Good stuff. Fucking Tyrion in Dinklage, season one. Man. Almost every line. Almost every line. I did not appreciate right. the first time I saw season one Dinklage like I should have. Because, I mean, even in episode one, he was killing it. And we talked about how it was either the second half of episode one or first part of episode two that he basically found the character. Like, he was probably one of the first ones to find the character. Yeah, but, I'm pretty sure he's been the only person associated with the show too to get any emmy or uh golden globe wins so yeah he i think i think he ended up winning for like season two or season three but they, they've all deserved a lot more than what they've gotten for the show uh from there they transition to another uh introduction and that is uh sam 
I had forgot it actually took them that many episodes to introduce him. I always assumed he was kind of there once John got there, but they introduced him after the fact. Um, yeah, th- and then the whole the whole exchange is pretty much any excuse Thorn has to be an asshole to Snow. He takes <laughs> pretty much. Um, the uh, the the actor uh, for Sam too. There's something ab- like. I, I almost think it's uh, it's partially probably the performance over time, and part of it too is like, did you notice like the way they they kind of designed the look of him? I guess they wanted everyone besides Snow at uh, the Night's Watch to kind of have an edge to them. Like he doesn't look as like friendly. Yeah. You get know what I'm saying? He doesn't look as inviting as a person. I guess to like show that you can't trust anyone, uh, you know, at, at the Night's Watch type of thing. Yeah, probably. Because, I mean, they all are, like, brigands and thieves and rapists and, yeah, you know, everything else. So, makes sense. Um, from, the, from there, we actually move over to uh, Khaleesi, Jora and Viserys. And, man, I cannot fucking wait for the Golden Crown. <laughs> That's the next episode, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's either the next one or the one after. I cannot fucking wait, though. I'm um, pretty sure... I'm pretty uh-huh. sure it's uh, two episodes from now because I think I looked ahead out of curiosity because that was actually <laughs> my probably my favorite episode from season one. Spoilers, Jeff. God. Oh, my God. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, you're right. Episode six, which I might point out, episodes five and six are still a nine and 9.1, respectively, and 9.2 on IMDb. On uh, you win or you die. Well, we'll get to that uh, in the the Golden Crown episode, but that was the moment where I decided I loved the show was the <laughs> Golden Crown scene. Because like I think every show or movie has that moment where it just sells you in one moment. <laughs> and yours is pouring molten metal over some poor bastard's head. Oh no, he was no, he was a deserving son of a bitch's head. <laughs> Still a poor bastard though. At the same time. That's uh, brutal, dude. Metal, so, okay, but brutal. So I am a complete moron, and I just now got the parallel between Jora becoming a part of Khaleesi's group and betraying her because of him being a slave, uh, a seller of slaves. Technically, he never did betray her. He spied on her. He He's- and- lied and didn't tell her yeah he lied and he spied but his job was to kill and yeah but he still i mean he did yeah. betray her yeah he, he he could have been a much bigger shithead about it and actually tried to fucking kill her but for for khaleesi if you lie that's that's damning enough. i did not realize how many opportunities he's fucking had either until going back yeah but yeah uh, it's just so it's so ironic and so fucking obvious that uh, like my note was he sells slaves and it's what leads him to be the guard and betrayer of Khaleesi the breaker of chains like it was all right there staring me at the, in the face and I just never connected the dots and she even has the line that says you sold slaves and she sounds so disgusted and appalled by it already yeah. here in season yeah, one all, already yeah there's a whole this is this is the dragon waking up this, yeah. this episode. Which, you know, makes sense, too, because technically that's what she was at the beginning of her marriage to Khal Drogo. Yeah. She was sold by her brother basically as meat. Yep. For personal gains. Yeah. Cannot wait for the golden crown. <laughs> so, uh, they transition to a scene, that j- which is, you're talking about fucking name dropping and foreshadowing and all sorts of shit. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce her name, um, but Khaleesi's handmaiden, who yes. Khaleesi sends over to v- v- uh, Viserys, it's spelled like it could be either uh, like Dori or Doria. I don't know how, pr- how to pronounce her name, but they have a scene where her and Viserys are together in a bathtub. I, for some reason, all through the six seasons now, this scene has always stuck with me. Even after the first time I watched it, and I don't know why. Maybe it's the incredibly hot woman in the bathtub. I'm going to throw that out there. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, that definitely cannot hurt. Uh, here, you get all kinds of shit. You get a history on the formation of the Iron Throne, about how it was you know, formed by uh, a thousand swords or whatever getting uh, 
melted together. Interesting enough, I actually I think read at some point the Iron Throne in the book is actually about five times the size of the one in the show. It's really? actually like literally a thousand swords, and they made it, you know, because it'd be kind of ridiculous looking for the show. Yeah. But I believe I read that in the book, and someone might be able to correct me on that, but I'm pretty sure I remember reading at some point how it is just fucking gigantic. Hmm. Um, he gives a lot of background on, uh, you know, like you get it. You actually get a perspective on just how many fucking dragons there were yeah. because he talks about how he used to name all of the names of the dragon heads to his dad. And, you know, he just names off, you know, like, you know, 12 off the top of his head. Like there used to be a fuck ton of dragons, which uh, could you, could you imagine like Westeros and all of these countries are terrifying enough just because of how much of an asshole everyone is. <laughs> and there were just fucking dragons everywhere. Not I only, would never go outside of my home. Not only that, she talked about how she always heard that the brave men killed all the dragons. She said, no, the brave men rode them. So we've already got foreshadowing you know, and alluding to Khaleesi riding on Charizard's back. Yeah. The, uh, and we have I, Aragon I always, references. I thought, <laughs> I thought it was a funny touch, a little touch too, how she uh, she pours the ca- the burning candle wax on him, yes. and he can't even handle the, the candle wax. Yes. Yeah. No, it's, that it, was fucking brilliant. Knowing what's to come. I know, and it's so subtle that you wouldn't pick up on it unless you knew. <laughs> it's just genius. And here's where the name dropping begins. She name drops the fucking House of Black and White. She actually talks about. Yes, you know, I, that I know blew guy, my mind. Right, I completely fucking forgot about this. Uh, I, I didn't write down the exact quote, but paraphrasing it, she says, "You know, I once I once met a man who could change his face like other people change their clothes." Yes, and then yeah, my mind was blown because I was like, "Damn, that is deep cuts." Because we don't we don't get to that. We don't get to jogging until like halfway through next season. Something like that, yeah. I mean, we had a little bit of it from Serio, but not enough to know that that's what fucking goes on there. You know what I mean? Like we just had, yeah. we just had the name drop of the the city or yeah. the country or whatever. We yeah, we haven't right. heard what they can do. Uh, she also uh, talks about dragon glass. Pretty sure that's the first time we've had mention of that. Yes. So yeah, she. From yeah, from where she was in you know, Bravo, she actually got a lot of correct information. And we got uh, we got uh, a little bit of history on Valeria or whatever it is. Also, you know, when they were riding dragons and they were forging Valerian steel, and we got all kinds of a uh, history and background on them that I don't think anyone ever talks about really ever again. Like, we see the ruins of one of their cities. That's where Jorah, um, you know, gets uh, gets touched by the stone men. But I can't think of another time where we even really talk about the history of Valeria. Yeah, I wonder if when shit really starts hitting the fan and they have to start actively gathering up as many of those swords as possible, I wonder if maybe... They'll dive into it again later on, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, did you have anything else to add with that sequence? No, no. It's just other than that scene just fucking wins the season almost, just knowing everything that's to come. It was really fucking cool. It was yeah. really cool. From there, they transition to uh, Sansa uh, walking through the throne room. And... How fucking unbearable is Sansa at this point? Like, oh, I just want to slap the shit out of Sansa, man. Oh, I know. I'm almost wishing that chick would. She has a line where she's like, I never want to speak to my dad again, and it just like fucking devastates you knowing what happened. Oh, I know. I know. And like, it's just Sansa, about how she could never forgive him also. Oh, my God. It's brutal. Yeah. It's fucking brutal. Um, let's see. We transition from there to uh, Ned, Varys, Littlefinger, and Rindley, and uh, Pycelle at the, the small council meeting. But and how weird is it to see Rindley now? I know. Well, like, I it's co- kind of awkward for me, because every time I see him, I'm like, oh yeah, you. I completely forgotten he was so involved in season one. Yeah, I know. I had to. Because he was always just kind of in the background, and you don't know how important he's going to be until obviously Robert's gone. So you just kind of really really pay attention to him, honestly. Yeah. Um 
so uh, this is Ned basically starting the the trail of clues. You know, trying to uh, figure out the mystery behind everything. And what? I actually had forgotten how much of season one to set up kind of like a medieval cloak and dagger type of thing. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, there's also one little touch I want to talk about before we get too deep into the scene. Um, there's one tiny little touch that they made <laughs> that I just loved. And that is Ned Stark is from the north where it's very, very cold. He is clearly fucking suffering. And he stops like at the end of every sentence to take a drink out of the cup. Yeah. You notice that? And like yeah, everyone, that's... everyone is a little bit wet, a little bit shiny. But he is like drenched in sweat. I just thought it was a really cool attention to detail. I love shit yeah, like that. I agree. Uh, man, if only they didn't wear like five fucking layers of clothing when it's 100 degrees outside. Like it might help guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, uh, Ned gets the, uh, the heritage book basically where he ends up figuring out from the the hair color i believe isn't that his yes. final kind of clue later on so he gets the, the 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 book that leads to that scene later on i probably in the next couple of episodes probably getting there pretty soon um he leaves with the book from Picel. uh you can really really tell how out of his element ned is because he is being an asshole to just about everyone yes when he really shouldn't be no they're already going to be out to get him regardless and he's really he's antagonizing them is not a good idea um we get a really really cool scene between uh aria and ned where uh, aria is continuing uh her uh quote-unquote dance master lessons yes where she's balancing at the top of the stairwell and her and Ned have a really, really great conversation about how... Sirio says. <laughs> do we what? Sirio says. Yeah. I love how obsessed she already is with him after, like, one lesson. Uh, same. <laughs> That's yeah, all right? I can say. <laughs> uh, see, I, was, I was hoping we'd get another scene with him in this episode. So, uh, they, Arya and Ned have this uh, long conversation about how, you know, uh, Arya, you're going to grow up you're going to have sons and your sons are going to do this, 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 and this, and this. And, you know, basically saying like, this is what is laid out for a woman of high nobility in these times. And then she yes. just says, no, that's not me. And goes right back to fucking sword practice. Like, yeah, fucking cool character development. Really, really, <laughs> really, really like the, the dynamic between Arya and Sansa in season one is really interesting to me because obviously we know what happens later on, but it like they, they really go out of their way to show you just how, cause like Sansa, it was 110% on board with what, uh, you know, I was going to say, doesn't this scene almost come on the heels of Sansa's scene and her talking about like, well, what if I only have girls and everyone yeah, will she's, hate she's, me? She's petrified by the, the, by the idea of letting people down because she views herself basically as just a prince maker. Yeah. Like yeah. It's crazy like the they're the how polar opposite they are. So it's going to be interesting actually to see them two together in the new season as well. Yes, that, I cannot fucking wait. Like if they're going to have some interesting conversations like cuz you know Sansa is completely different now and Arya might actually end up kind of like when Arya hears, "Oh, you you sicked fucking hounds on Ramsay." I can get behind that. Right. I'm kind of a fan of the murder. I'm a fan of the murder. Yeah. yeah while while she was cooking the dude's sons into chili. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh-huh. Oh, your tears oh. are delicious. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, fucking uh, fucking Ten- Scott Tenneman, right? Scott yeah. Tenneman, him. Yeah. Also, South Park needs to come back. Yes. We transition back to John and Sam on the wall. They have a really, really great exchange, basically, where I like the line where Sam's like, I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> John's <laughs> like, so you can't fight. You're a coward. You're afraid of heights and probably everything else. Like, why are you here? And they go into this whole backstory. Again. What was what was even better than the I'm afraid of heights part was... But just before that, he was like, oh, I don't see well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, because he says that after he, he was assigned specifically as your watch partner. Yes. So we'll see you all. <laughs> yeah. Uh, man, Sam's asshole of a dad lives up to that story, too, when you meet him later on. Oh, my God, I know. I've forgotten just how dark that story was. Like, it I was think, fucked up. I think back the first time I watched this, that went completely over my head. Because that's kind of unfathomable, but after six seasons of this show, I was just like, oh yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> you know? Especially after you've met him and he's one of the most unlikable assholes on the show of unlikable assholes. I know. Unlikable assholes to the TV show. Uh, did you have anything else to add with this portion? No, I, I just thought it was a really great scene. Isn't that the first time that they bond also? Basically, I love. I've always liked the the Sam and and John bromance, which actually is just a quick aside. I thought it was kind of odd they never had Sam actually figure out John was dead while he was dead. Yeah, I you know. Think, you think they would have done that, but I, I guess they they had so much plot going on they didn't really have time. Well, they got so much plot going on, and then realistically, how long was he dead versus how long would it take news of that to travel to where he was? You know? Yeah, it's true. Because I mean, just, we, you'd, you'd think they would have found a way, but I understand why. <laughs> they should have foxed him. Yeah. <laughs> uh, from there, we go to uh, Littlefinger and Ned walking through the Garden of Betrayal. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone hasn't seen the South Park episodes for Game of Thrones, you must watch them. They're He's gonna amazing. betray you. <laughs> we actually no, okay. Now this scene's also pretty clever. And because there's also a correction we have to make in this scene also. Yeah. Littlefinger points out how one of the kids nearby is one of Varys' little birds. Yes. Now what's clever about this is because of it because it's Littlefinger, he easily could have been lying. Yeah. But he was actually when you think about it and you know the future seasons, he was absolutely telling him the truth right there. Yes. That, that totally was one of his literal little birds. It was. And yeah. You know, that was the correction I had to make because you and I were flabbergasted in season six when we found out it was the kids, and I think we had said that was the first time we ever saw any of his little birds. Technically, season one, episode four, was the first time we saw one of Varys' birds and we found out what the, who the birds were. And then later they became a murder of crows because <laughs> they fucking started shaking everybody. <laughs> Um, that, this was one of my favorite lines too from season one is of course fucking Baelish uh, distrusting me was the wisest thing you've done since you climbed off your horse foreshadowing cause fucking Littlefinger dude he's so fucking good at lying he does the genius thing You when, you're, when you are wanting to lie you have to give a certain portion of the truth to sell yourself yes which is exactly what he does that entire sequence well, honestly the way I took that line was a little bit different. The way I took that line is he's kind of having fun at this point. Because he knows full, full well what he's up to and what he's probably about to do here in yeah. a few episodes. And, you know, he's he's a snake is what he basically is. So that was fun to him. Did you see the look on his face and his expression when he said it? And then when he turns to walk away, his expression is different. Like he's almost laughing to himself. Like it's an well, end joke for him. He, he loves manipulating people regardless. And this is, this is a manipulation of the guy who, in his opinion, stole his woman from him. Yes. So he specifically fucking hates Ned Stark. And we get a good representation of that when, uh, you know, they, they actually, I think, end one of the episodes on the line of once they turn on Ned in the throne room, it's Littlefinger who has the last line against him. But, yeah, uh, dude, that that's that's the way that I took that line was um, at this point he's enjoying himself. Like, he's literally full on having a blast doing this. He's smart enough to know that Ned has no idea what he's doing or who he's doing it to. He's too honor bound. Yeah. He would never think that way. Um, Ned continues the clues and he actually finds Gendry. It's our first time meeting Gendry. Yes. Um, already like that character, even the first time I saw this. Um, and Ned's problem is not that he's stupid, 
It's just that he is, like you said, he is too honor bound. He figures out just by looking at him and by what was asked of Gendry by John Aaron that he's the bastard son of Robert. Yes. Like after like talking to him for a minute and a half, and the, like I just I think it's really interesting. It's like for Ned Stark to be in the position to of what gets him killed later on, show he he was smart enough to play the game. He just played the game incorrectly. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is also the scene, what is more, even more monumental, this is the scene that eventually leads to Ned Stark figuring everything out because he specifically says that his mom was blonde and he's got, he's black of hair. And then later, even when Ned's going through the book, all the Lannisters are blonde of hair, all the Baratheons are black of hair. And that's when he figures out that what well, who we think are Baratheon sons are actually all Lannisters. So yeah, man, I'm not ready for Sean Bean to die for the five thousandth time. <laughs> I know you think after all this time we'd be ready for it, but never, never. It gets are. me every time just because he is so honor bound that you know you would think he would die for his honor, but because of what Varys says to him, he eventually just kind of caves in and throws his honor to the wayside, and then he dies. Yep. And it was all for nothing. Yep. Fuck you, Game of Thrones. I'm done. Fuck you, Game of Thrones. <laughs> well, at least they fucking make their deaths mean something. Walking dead. You <laughs> sons of bitches. Okay. Uh, Let, so let's talk about that Walking Dead teaser, Jeff. Let's let's not. Let's just not. <laughs> so, uh, Ned Stark's... Uh, he, his uh, assistant dude who he has with him at uh, King's Landing is Jory. And he starts sending him around uh, to the point to where he ends up getting into a conversation, sending a message for Ned to Jamie. And this is another conversation where you just start getting like name dropped out the ass. Uh, so Jamie's in front of uh, Robert's room where Robert is just fucking with him by <laughs> banging like 12 different prostitutes. Did you really just say he was fucking with him? It's <laughs> oh, amazing. So let's see. They the, so him and Jamie they start getting a conversation about the Battle of Pike because Jamie doesn't recognize him, but Jory does because he talks about how they were uh, they were in a battle side by side at one point. And I don't know if you caught this, but the name they drop is Thoros of Mir. Did you catch that? I did. Thoros of Mir is the Red Priest who brings back the dude in the later season. Uh, who's with the Brotherhood Without Banners, that guy. Right. And when they dro- name-dropped him, I was like, Jesus, they really did have this crap planned out because that's some deep... He even talks about how his sword was on fire. And if you remember, uh, I don't think you ever see Thoros' sword on fire, but those dudes, I think Beric Dondarrion's sword is on fire in the fight with the Hound. Yeah. Yeah, uh, fucking... I just... We already knew this show was layered. We already knew it was dense. We already knew it was planned out. You don't realize how dense it is until you've seen everything up to current and go back. It's crazy. More good foreshadowing is when uh, Jory is talking to Jamie about Theon back at at Winterfell. And he says, oh, Theon, he's a good lad. And then Jamie just says, I doubt it. (laughs) And when you think back to the very beginning of the episode, when Tyrion is leaving Winterfell... He starts talking shit to Theon. Yeah. And it's crazy just how fucking perfectly Jamie and Tyrion had Theon pegged. And everyone who lived with him had no idea what was about to happen with him. Yeah. Jamie and, and Tyrion really only knew him by reputation. And they figured out what would end up happening. I thought that was a cool little detail. Uh, look, let's see. From there, we go back to the Night's Watch. Um, John starts to defend Sam after they've started to become friends, like we pointed out earlier. Oh, dude, I had forgotten about this scene, I, too. Yes. When fucking Snow, Ghost, and his boys <laughs> threaten that guy, the rapist guy, compl- that is fucking edgy for Snow Yeah. in retrospect. I would completely forgot about that scene. That's probably the most hard-ass Snow has ever been on the show. Dude. I just... I have to admit, though, I laughed out loud 
when the three of them slowly backed away because it kind of reminded me of like uh was it christopher drake that was making fun of everyone doing piano renditions of theme songs the way he would do his hand pulling away from the piano like i don't know something about that It, it just made me think of that and i just laughed but dude ghost on his chest i would have shat myself right there so the guy listens to the threat, and then when they are back in training, he starts going easy on on Sam to the to an obvious extent, and that ends up being kind of a joke. Where um, I think it, uh, what's it, what's the name of the guy who uh, no he let Sam knock him down? You know what I'm talking about though. Yeah, I know. I haven't caught his name yet, but actually, Thorn is correct in their conversation and argument they end up having because they are taking it at this point as basically a joke. So Thorn is a complete prick about the way he's going about their training, but he's not wrong. Yeah. They need to be more serious because they do not understand, like, even if they didn't know White Walkers were coming, shit like that will get you killed against the Wildlings. Yeah. So I, I just thought that was kind of cool. Uh, an actor we don't have never really given proper pop, uh, props to, I think, is the Alistair Thorn actor because he, he was always great. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, that character also is almost unanimously just seen as a douchebag but while he's a douchebag he did have good intentions you know what i mean um he even said um i can't remember if it was when he was killing snow or when snow was hanging him that he said that he genuinely believes snow's doing the right thing but so is he you know like uh, he he He's trying to look out for the Night's Watch in his own way. Yeah. He, he he didn't do it with malicious intent. He genuinely thought he was doing the right thing with everything. He's basically he did. Arlie Ernie. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Just more dickish. Of course. Arlie Ernie's actually uh, very awesome. From there, we go back to one of the best scenes from season one, and that is when Viserys goes after da- uh, Daenerys. I tent. love this scene. And I just think it's so fucking hilarious that, you know, they have so many good Khaleesi lines in quick succession. He starts uh, basically uh, calling calling her out. The first line she says, like, I wrote down was, you have no right to a braid. You've won no victories yet. Yes. That's one of those, like, damn. Yeah. Love it. Love it. That, that was already a mic drop. It's so funny. How Viserys is the one to always, you know, fucking spout off, oh, you're going to wake up the dragon. You're yeah. going to wake up the dragon. It's like, well, you did, but it wasn't you, buddy. Like, <laughs> you have no idea who you're fucking with. The the next time you raise a hand to me will be the last time you have hands. Dude. It's one of the most metal lines in fictional history. That, that's the Khaleesi we know from season six. And if you notice, too, the lead up to it is what does she always like to do? She starts spouting off all of her titles. Yes. I think that's the first time she ever starts spouting off all five bajillion of her titles, <laughs> which I thought was a really cool little touch. Dude, if, if you did not remember uh, the dude from Family of Blood and Doctor Who, his facial expressions are the exact same ones here after she um, hits him and then starts... Um, spouting off all of her titles and threatening him and everything. It's the exact same. Like, he looks just like when he was a kid back in Doctor Who in that scene. That guy needs to be in more stuff. He's always really good. Yeah, he's a really, really good actor. I really like him. Um, Even though he's a scarecrow now. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, we scarecrow. go from there. We transition back to Sam and Oh, did you have anything else to add with the Khaleesi scene? Nope. Okay. From there, we go back to Sam and John. Uh, more bromance. They start talking about basically how they're both virgins. Uh, I think I thought it was so hilarious how John talks about how it almost happened once with a redhead. I just thought it was so funny that they made such a good point, like a big point of making it out to be a redhead. Yeah. Because of what you know with Egret later on. I just thought that was a really, really fun little detail. Uh, Not to mention that, the priestess too. Yes. Uh, That's where my mind went. There's there's so much so much fucking And then Sam has the line of I like redheads. Yeah. And isn't uh Gilly redhead? Gilly I actually think is more like dirty blonde, but she's always 
usually in the first few seasons you see here, she's like wilding looking where you can't really tell. So yeah. I, I might be wrong. We'll have to wait and see on that one. And while we're talking about that, uh, we were talking earlier about how good the Thorn actor is. His monologue of being outside the wall is fantastic. Yes, it was. He is like he's. It was one of those scenes that we talked about in the new season with stuff like the, with the High Sparrow and that one scene. Well, like you completely fucking believe this guy was in this fantasy setting and did all this shit. Because when he starts talking about how like we had to eat the horses and that was okay when we had to eat each other, that's when it got you know fucked up type of thing. Yeah. He is so fucking serious. You're just like, God damn. Like, yeah, I think he actually ate someone, Jeff. <laughs> Man, it, it was it was very, very fucking disturbing and really, really well done. That whole uh, scene is actually well constructed the moment that he enters the room. Because um, the, the thing that always bothered me about that scene was... Um, Snow and Sam, like, they went from being adults to all of a sudden be, like, six years old all of a sudden when he walks in. Something about that always bothered me, and I don't know what. Um, but as soon as he walks into the scene, up until he leaves the scene, there are camera angles and, and everything, and plus the actor and his monologue. It's an intense, intense scene, and it's just dialogue from one person. Yeah, it's it's really, really, really well written and acted. Um, let me see. Oh, uh, we also got another name drop. That's the first time I think we might have heard Mance Raider. Because uh, so. Thorne talks about him. Um, I'm excited to get him back on the show, too. I always really liked the guy who was Mance Raider. Uh, we transitioned back to Khaleesi and Jorah. Uh, this is... K- Khaleesi's pretty much gone into... Probably about seventy five percent of the way towards Khaleesi. She is completely op- like open about her opinions. She is not holding back. She is pretty much committing treason because she's not wrong in the fact that Viserys, if they're really, really holding true to their lineage rules and stuff like that, like she is being a traitor to her own family and to the king. Yes, if they're going to take it that seriously, and she is being completely open about how she doesn't want to be king, she starts calling him out, basically saying uh, along the lines of, "He's not fit to rule. He couldn't rule if he even wanted to. Yeah, you know, even I think her line is like, he couldn't rule even if my husband gave him an army, type of thing.' Yeah, yeah. Um, more Khaleesi opening up. Did you Flash forward to that scene? Flash forward to season six, and she's igniting an entire room of calls on fire. Oh, I can't wait to watch that again. <laughs> we just watched that, and I can't wait to watch that again at some point. It's so good. <laughs> We're just going to redo season six over again just because. Oh, give a shit. <laughs> because fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then we go to uh, one of the last scenes of the episode. Uh, it goes to the jousting match. And I had completely forgotten that uh, this was the first time Littlefinger met Sansa. And you can already tell in his creepy fucking way, he's already obsessed with Dude, Sansa because he can't have Pat. She's so much younger that this scene was just much more creepier than I remember. It's so disturbing. I guess since I know what direction it's headed. Yeah. But, yeah. It's, it's fucked up. Um, now, this was actually something I wanted to bring up. I had forgotten they had recast the mountain. Did you remember that? No. They have a different actor for the mountain right here because they end up having uh, the guy that we we all know from from the like the mountain of the viper fight. That's the main actor we all know, like the guy who's done all of the the strength competitions and shit like that. He was he's been recasted. Uh, the actress who was Marcella was recasted at one point. Why the fuck was Rickon not recasted, Ron? <laughs> Rickon or Bran? No, Rickon. Like we talked about it. Like a big problem with the Battle of the Bastards scene. Is he looks like he's twenty five? Why the fuck is he not serpentining? Yeah. If you're gonna recast, oh, uh, and uh, Dario, he was recasted. See, Dario gonna- was the one that I always remembered because he went from you know he can't believe that it's not butter to <laughs> and what looks like an actual assassin slash cell sword. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah. All of these examples of recasting, and then the one person that needed to be recasting for plot elements was Rickon. I can buy into Rickon a lot more than Bran right now. Well, no, I'm not even talking about. No, I'm not talking about acting ability. I'm talking about in the Battle of the Bastard scene. 
if they actually have a nine-year-old kid, or an eight, I think in the books even supposed to be six at that point, like a really little kid. If you recast him, then no one bitches about him not serpentining because he's a little kid freaking out. In yeah. that scene, the Rickon actor is literally taller than fucking Ramsey. And Ramsey calls him like a little guy or something. Yeah, he says like little man. Yeah. I have no I just thought it was very odd. They have a history of recasting fucking recast Rickon. I don't I don't know. I still love that episode, but it was just a weird little thing they, they didn't go about. Rubber doing. sword and all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, this shows you more of no. This is a basically Lucin being wrapped up by the Lannisters. Um, how the, the they made a point earlier on in the episode about how the knight that just got promoted for basically no reason was the guy who was John Aaron Squire, and then oh, he happens to be jousting the mountain, and then he happens to be murdered in front of everybody. Yeah, that is just pure Lannisters being the Lannisters, and yeah. They're fucking diabolical, dude. Like that went over my head probably the first time too. Even though now, you really, really pay uh, pay attention to I, it. I know for a fact it went over my head because when I was watching it this time, I was like, "Huh, I I did not remember at all that that was not an accident." And I mentioned at the very top of the episode about how it was kind of like a mashup of campfire stories. None of them more so than the mountain and the hound story. Oh, it's dude. presented, shot, and has musical cues almost like they're huddled around a campfire at night. Dude, Baelish's line delivery through that entire story is just amazing. You're, you're like edge of your seat and nothing's happening. Yeah, and, and, and I know the story. Yeah, and, right. And I'm still edge of my seat. Yeah. You're still totally edge of your seat. Yeah, that whole scene's fantastic. Um man, I cannot wait for what they do with the hound in the upcoming season, dude. When he goes walking tall. I fucking <laughs> love the I love the hound, dude. I fucking love that. Dude, I'm excited for fucking season four with the uh the adventures of Arya and the Hound. The adventures of Arya and the Hound. <laughs> I think I've that? read that book. I think I've Where's read that, that book. Where, I want that as the next Disney animated film. <laughs> <laughs> He's just actually an anthropomorphic dog. Yeah, as I, I say, it's just like shit. basically Lilo and a dog. I'd watch around. that shit, dude. Watch that shit in a heartbeat. And then when they close... Oh, no, they go from there to uh, a really, really cool scene between Ned and Cersei. They start talking shit to each other, basically not saying it specifically, but kind of like calling each other out for I'm on to you type of thing. And then they threaten each other. <laughs> I was also trained to kill my enemies, your grace, as was I. Yeah. And after watching the end of season six, I think Cersei was trained a little bit better than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that scene's awesome. I'm, I'm still not prepared for Sean Bean. And they end the episode. Did you have anything else to add with that one? Nope. We end the episode back with Sansa and uh, her bodyguard. I need to figure out that guy's name too, but he's kind of like the the Stark's bodyguard, like yeah. right hand man type of guy. He's uh, escorting um, fucking Catelyn, and they're in this. Uh, inn. He, he's their man at arms, right? Something like that. They're at an inn and. Uh, Tyrion happens to walk in. Fucking poor Tyrion, dude. If there was ever a case of wrong place at the wrong time for like six seasons of television, it is Tyrion <laughs> Lannister, dude. <laughs> um, yeah, he he walks in, uh, Tyrion being Tyrion, and then we get introduced to fucking Bronn, dude, who I completely forgotten about it was introduced this way. I was like, oh! it was like I found my long lost uncle, dude. I was right. so excited. I fucking love Bronn. One um, of my absolute we're top just five a, favorite characters is Braun. We're we're just uh, an episode of, or episode or two away from him fighting on Tyrion's behalf. Do you even fight with honor? No, but he did. He did. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, and the uh, Golden Crown were the first two things where I was like, I fucking adored this TV show. <laughs> Yeah, that moment with Braun, I think, may have been when I was permanently sold. Whether the show was going to be any good or not, I was watching it after that point. so fucking After awesome. he kicks the guy through the door. It makes him fly. Yeah. Yeah, so fucking good. So... I just uh, can't wait to have Braun back in it, dude. It's been so long. Yeah, it really has been. I hope it's because that actor's been busy doing other things and being Braun in those things also. 
<laughs> he, he really needs to uh, be in more shit and always just be brawn. Al- always be brawn, ABB. <laughs> <laughs> so Kat decides at this moment to turn on Tyrion. She calls basically all of the soldiers from different families that are honor bound to the Starks around the room to her aid. Um, Did you notice also that one of the names she calls out? I think this is the first mention we get of Walder Frey. Yes. So many fucking people get name dropped in this episode. I, I probably missed some. I don't know if he said he's going to take another wife and Tyrion's just like, <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> That's another thing. You, you don't even get the punchline if you haven't uh, gone back to revisit it. Right. But it it alludes to such like a history in their backstory. You know, like everybody obviously knows Walder Frey. And him being senile and crazy and having all these, like, teenage wives and, yeah. Fuck, I, I just feel so bad for Tyrion. He's like the one Lannister who's on a douchebag and they all just want to fucking murder him. <laughs> well, he is kind of douchebaggish in this one, but not to the extent of, like, Jamie or, uh, um, God, I'm tired. Cersei? Yes, thank you. I need to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah. When you can't this think is, of Cersei's name, fucking Sarah Connor herself, it's time to go to bed. And it is just, it is so sad how fucking poorly Kat and Ned are in season one with their decision making. Oh, I know. At every turn, they fuck up where there is an opportunity to fuck up. And it's devastating because they're, they're, they are good people. And at this point in the show, like, Catelyn should be blaming Tyrion because that's where all the evidence points. But they need to understand at this point in the show that, like, it's very convenient that all of the evidence is pointing where it points. They, no one knows yet the scale or the scope of Jamie and Cersei. You know, no one realizes exactly what's going on until it's too late. And, dude, uh, even on that point... Even the viewer doesn't understand the full scope of Cersei until the Winds of Winter, the brand new episode. Yeah, like that. It's not until then you're like you realize what she is fully capable of, and it's 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 crazy. But yeah, uh, did you have anything else you want to touch back on for this episode? No, I think that just about wraps it up. Yeah, very very good episode. I like the format of basically having all of the backstories. I'm actually curious to to like if I could go back in time and see my reaction to the first the first fresh viewing. I was like, "What the fuck are they talking about?" <laughs> like, I just I just now figured out who the Lannisters are, and you're throwing out like fucking Thoros a mirror. Yeah, you know, like yeah, it's very very dense, but that's what makes it that's what makes it good. Uh, if you want to check us out more, please like and subscribe. Blah, blah, blah. Like and subscribe. <laughs> it is so late. Time for you to go to bed too, eh? Yeah, I'm just done. <laughs> I'm just done. <laughs> Please like and subscribe. Easy for me to say. That gets you all of our content, uh, all of our Let's Plays, reaction shows, podcasts galore. They're all on the channel. We also have Facebook and Twitter links below in the description if you're interested. And most importantly, if you know anyone else that might also enjoy our content, we would greatly appreciate the share. For this night and all the nights to come, I'm Jeff. I'm Ron. And this watch has ended. Bye.